Hi, here's a review of our introductory to statistics course. Uh, I have this review broken up into three different sections. The first part is reviewing tests of significance, and then we'll look at a review of confidence intervals, and finally the third part is the other big ideas that we've missed by uh, not having them in those first two sections. Um, if you remember way back when, first week of class, we talked about a single proportion, and the example we used was Buzz and Doris, and whether or not Buzz would pu push the correct button when the light was flashing or the light was on steady. Um, our null hypothesis was that Buzz will randomly pick a button. You know, he doesn't understand the light system. So in other words, we can say in the long run he's going to push the correct button 50% 50 50 of the time. Um, the alternative hypothesis is that, no, Buzz understands what Doris is communicating to him, and he'll choose the button more than 50% of the time in the long run. And if you remember, Buzz knew what was going on, or appeared to at least. He got it right 15 out of 16 times, so he got it right 93.75% of the time. And we developed a null distribution by flipping coins, and we flipped 16 coins. And if it landed heads, we call that a correct guess, and tails, incorrect guess. And then we're looking at the proportion of those 16 flips that landed heads. And you can see, you know, a lot of time it was around 50% heads, 50% tails. And not very many times um, that he would, uh, the coin would flip and get 15 heads out of 16 or more. And that, that was our p-value. And then also with the single proportion, we moved into theory-based tests. And remember, theory-based tests for proportions work fairly well if there's at least 10 successes and 10 failures. And we did not have that with the Buzz and Doris situation. Um, we used a normal distribution to predict what the null distribution would look like. We saw a lot of our null distributions in Chapter 1. They're symmetric. They're centered on that value under the null hypothesis. And we just need to find out what the variability is in it. And that's why we use the simulation. And the normal distribution predicts that as well. And then uh, the next time we did tests of significance, we were comparing two proportions. And again, the example was with dolphins. Um, we had swimming with dolphins to see if there's an association between that and showing substantial improvement in depression symptoms. And the null was that the dolphins have no effect, that swimming with dolphins or in that control group where they're not swimming with dolphins, uh, the proportion that would have substantial improvement would be about the same. Or their difference in those two proportions would be zero. And the alternative hypothesis was that swimming with dolphins was going to increase the probability of substantial improvement in depression symptoms, or the probability that swimming with dolphins uh, the probability that your depression symptoms are improved swimming with dolphins is going to be greater than the control, or the difference is greater than zero. Um, and here's the results from that study. And note there's, there's 15 in each group. So there are 15 in the control group, 15 in the dolphin group. And if there was no association, we'd sort of think that, you know, those 13 people that improved there, they should be about equally distributed between the dolphin group and the control groups. So I expect things like 7 and 6, 8 and 5, something like those in groups. But here we got 10 and 3. And so the question really is, well, what's the probability we get something as extreme as 10 and 3 just by chance if, in fact, they were evenly distributed? So that's really how we set up to find a null distribution for this. So if the null hypothesis is true, the dolphin therapy is not better, uh, we would have those 13 improvers and those 17 non-improvers, regardless of which group they were assigned to. And any differences in those groups arises solely, of, solely from the randomness of the assignment to the group. So essentially, we can randomly assign the groups to the improvers and the non-improvers. And that's basically what we did with the cards. So here's that situation with uh, the cards and the shuffling that we're going to do here in a minute. Um, so in the dolphin therapy group, you can see there were lots of improvers in there. And in the control group, there weren't that many improvers. But the null says they should be about the same. So with the cards, what we do is shuffle those cards and then randomly distribute them in the two groups. And in this case, I can say I've got one, two, three, four, five, six improvers in the dolphin therapy group, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the control group. That's kind of what I'd expect under the null. Something again like six and seven, seven and six, eight and five, five and eight. 
But our statistic was the difference in the proportion. So here's the two proportions given under there. They're different. So that negative 0.067 is our, our simulated statistic. And that's going to be a point in the null distribution. And we do that a thousand times to develop a null distribution. We find out well, where is our sample statistic in that. And our sample statistic was about 0.47. You see, again, that's way out in the tail. So we've got strong evidence uh, against the null for the alternative or strong evidence that dolphins really do seem to help uh, improve depression symptoms. And then, just like with a single proportion, when we're moving to theory-based tests, um, it's going to work fairly well when there's at least 10 successes and 10 failures in each group. And again, with this dolphin study, again, we didn't have 10 successes and 10 failures, so this would not be a good candidate uh, to do a theory-based test. And again, normal distributions are used. Uh, because our null distribution is going to fit that nicely. And that's going to predict that shape. And remember, these ones are always centered at zero. And a lot of things we saw since then were centered at zero, unlike that first chapter where they're centered in that value under the null, which was not zero. And then moving into comparing two means. Uh, you might remember this example was this British doctor that rode his bike to work and he got this new carbon frame bike, a light frame bike, and he wanted to see if there was a difference in the commute times between using those two bikes. So we'd randomly assign, he'd flip a coin and decide which bike he was going to use that day. So the null is that there's no association between which bike is used and the commute time, or those two means are the same in the long run, or their difference is zero. And the alternative is there is some sort of an association. So here we're doing a two-sided test. You know, we don't know if the steel frame bike will be faster or the carbon frame bike, even or if either one is significantly faster, then we'd be rejecting the null. And here are the results. And you can see both looking at those dot plots or the box plots, and particularly the medians in the box plots, they're about the same place. You look at the means in the table below. And, you know, they're very similar, 108.34 and 107.81. And so our statistic is that difference in those two means. And again, just like with comparing two proportions, we're going to say, well, what's the likelihood we get something as extreme as that? And 0.53 probably doesn't seem too extreme, uh, just by chance. So to develop a null distribution, we can do the pretty much the same thing we did with comparing two proportions. But instead of putting the response as a word on the cards, we're going to put a number because it's a quantitative response. And But we'll shuffle them and, and calculate the uh, two means very similar way we did the two proportions. So since there were 56 times, we need 56 cards. And we'd write the times on all 56 cards and then shuffle them up put 26 cards in one pile and 30 cards in the other pile because those were the two sample sizes here. And then we calculate the difference in means, repeat that many times to develop a null distribution. So here's an example of that. So here's the original data with this. And here's the two means you can see. And if I shuffle them up, I should expect about half of the blue cards and half of the red cards to be in each pile. And here's the new two means of the shuffled data. And there's the difference in means. And so that's going to be a point in our null distribution. Again, you have to repeat that like a thousand times or more. So here's a null distribution with I think it has a thousand shuffles in it. And you can see our difference in means, which was 0.53, is not very significant. Um, it's, it's fairly close to the middle there. And we get this huge p-value. So there's not a significant difference in the long run mean times between those two bytes. And then with theory-based methods. Um, so this is now mean. So theory-based test works well here when the sample size is at least 20. We don't have successes and failures like in proportions. So here we just look at the one sample size. And if it's at least 20, and as long as the data isn't highly skewed, uh, then a t distribution works fairly well to predict the shape of a null distribution. And a t distribution is very similar to a normal distribution. It's just a little wider, and it's dependent on sample size, a little wider in the tails. And the sample size is fairly large, normal and t are almost identical. And then also with means, we did this match pairs example. And the first example we looked at here was base running times. Um, and remember, we had a narrow path and a wide path. And the researcher wanted to know, what is, is one fa path faster to go from home plate to second base? 
on average. And to test this, instead of having a one group of people do the narrow path and a different group of people do the wide path, he had the same group of people do both paths. That, that's, this is what makes it a paired, paired test. And so what we're looking for is those difference in times for each individual on here. So the null is going to be that long-term difference in times, that long-term mean difference in times, I should say, is zero or on average the mean of the differences between the two running paths and we're going narrow minus wide for this is going to be zero and the alternative is not zero one of those paths is going to be faster and one's going to be slower than the other and here's our result for this data set when you look at it with the uh, parallel box or parallel dot plots like in this case it looks like oh there's lots of overlap there doesn't seem to be much of a difference but this is not the way we should be looking at this data set we really be, need to be looking at things paired up on there because we're really looking at a difference of that differences between those so the null basically says that the running path doesn't matter so we can randomly decide which time goes with which path you know, notice we're not breaking our pairs here. We're going to be flipping a coin and randomly switching paths, but not breaking up the pairs. And then each time we do this, we're going to compute a simulated difference in means and repeat that a whole bunch of times to develop a null distribution. So here's an example of the, of the data. At least I've got numbers for the first 10 runners, and then the dots are for all the 22 runners. And that dot plot down below, this is really how we should be looking at the data. So this is the sample data. And if there was no difference in the mean times, I should see this centered at about zero. And it doesn't really look like it's quite centered at zero. But again, what we're going to do is we're going to flip a coin. And if the coin lands heads, we're going to switch the times for a runner. And what that's going to do is change the difference in those times from negative to positive or positive to negative, depending on what it is originally. So here we go. We're going to flip a coin, and it lands heads here. So those two times switch, and this one changed from a negative to positive. This one lands on heads, so it doesn't change. This one's heads. So again, it changes this time from positive to negative. And what should happen then, you should get about those half of those points that were positive should switch to negative, and about half the points that were negative should switch to positive. And so you should get this distribution that's going to end up uh, approximately centered at zero. And what we're really doing is saying, well, our original distribution, that wasn't quite centered at zero, but was it approximately? Was it close to zero? And that's really what the p-value is going to tell us when we get done here. So there's a simulated difference in means for this um, randomization of, of this data set. And that's going to be a point, that point zero one six. that's going to be a point in the null distribution. And here is a null distribution for this. And our original difference in means, or mean difference, was 0 0.075. And you can see that's way, way out at the edge of that null distribution. So a tiny p-value, so the in this case the base path time does matter for that one. There is going to be a difference in those two. And then for theory-based tests, well, again, it's means. So um, the theory-based test will work well for a sample size of at least 20. Again, as long as you, your distribution isn't highly skewed, your distribution of differences. And just like comparing two means, that t distribution will be used for this to predict the shape of the null distribution. Um, and the data used in this test are the differences and this is the same test for a single mean. So if you were doing a, a single mean test, like comparing, if you were wearing candy bar weights and you have a whole bunch of weights of candy bars, you're comparing it against what the label says, something like that. That's essentially this test, You'd except you're not subtracting, but it's, it's this test on a theory-based, uh, looking at it as a theory-based on this. And then, kind of moving into Unit 3, we started looking at comparing multiple groups. So the first one was multiple proportions. Um, and this test, if you remember, was looking at does the arrival pattern of vehicles coming to a four-way stop, does that arrival pattern affect or is it associated with whether or not the vehicle comes to a complete stop? And the, t the three groups were if a vehicle arrives all by itself, there's nobody in front of it or behind it, if the vehicle is a lead vehicle in a pack of vehicles, or if that vehicle is one of the following vehicles in a, in a pack of vehicles. 
Um, so the null hypothesis is that there's no association between the rival pattern and whether or not the vehicle comes to a complete stop. In other words, that probability that um, a car comes to a complete, complete stop is going to be the same whether it's a single vehicle, lead vehicle, or following vehicle. And the alternative is that there is an association between the rival pattern and whether or not the vehicle comes to a complete stop. And writing the alternative in symbols gets a little difficult because it's not that they're all different, it's just at least one of those is different. So at least one of those long-term probabilities is not the same or it's different than the others. So they all don't have to be different, just at least, just at least one of them has to be different. And for this, remember, we use the MAD statistic. And the MAD statistic is that mean absolute differences. But when you calculate, you kind of do those words backwards. Um, it's the find the differences between the three conditional proportions. You take the absolute values of those differences. And then you find the mean of those differences. So in this case, with our data, you can see 80, about 85, 86% of the single vehicles came to a complete stop. The lead vehicles, it was a little more, 90% and the following vehicles was a little less, you know, 77%. So taking those three conditional proportions, we're using those to calculate the MAD statistic. So that MAD statistic here, 0 0.086, represents the average distance our three proportions are apart from each other. The average distance our three proportions are apart from each other. And if the MAD statistic is zero, remember that that means our proportions all had to be the same. And the bigger the MAD statistic, the further apart our proportions are. So if there's no association between the rival pattern, whether or not a vehicle comes to a complete stop, it basically means it doesn't matter what the arrival pattern is. Some vehicles are going to stop no matter what, whether they're a lead vehicle, following vehicle, or a single vehicle, and some vehicles won't. So essentially, uh, developing a null distribution, it's that same shuffling model. You know, we can either shuffle the explanatory variable, the applet will shuffle the response. We can think of it as cards, you know, just like comparing two means, but we've got three groups instead of two. And then when we get done with each shuffle, we're going to compare the MAD, we're going to compute the MAD statistic, and that's going to be a point in the null distribution. And so here is a null distribution for this situation. And you can see we've got a p-value that's not really small, but it's sort of out there on the tail. So we don't really have strong evidence against the null. It's moderate. It's getting there. Perhaps a larger sample size would show a difference. But, so not strong in this case, but it's in the moderate category. And then theory-based tests. So we're proportions again, so we're using those same validity conditions we've always used for proportions, at least 10 successes and 10 failures with this. And the MAD statistic is not the one that's used for a theory-based test, but that's where we had to switch the statistic to a chi-squared statistic. And a chi-squared is just another way of finding out how far apart the proportions are from each other. And a zero chi-squared means they're all the same. Um, but it's a chi-squared statistic, and so then it's going to be a chi-squared distribution. And that's called a chi-squared test. And then multiple means. And multiple means, very similar to multiple proportions, you know, except we've, again, we've got a quantitative response. We're calculating means instead of proportions. Um, in this example, remember, we're we were looking at reading comprehension and whether the students were shown this picture before, a picture after, or no picture at all. You know, and there were three separate groups. We did this example in class. And the null is going to be there's no association between whether or not they see a picture or when they see a picture in their comprehension of the passage. So the response is going to be a, a comprehension score. And the null is going to say that the mean for those three groups are all going to be the same. And the alternative is that there is an association between whether a picture was shown and the comprehension. And again, just like with proportions, at least one of them is different. So at least one of those mean comprehension scores will be different. And here's the results in, from this test. And this was tested on Hope College students. And you can see there is quite a difference, not necessarily between the none and the after. Those box plots look about the same, but the picture before is, looks like it's significantly higher than the others. So it had a, a much higher uh, mean. Looks like I have the means on the side there. They're mixed up. The mean for the before should be that 4.95, because uh, that, that's much higher than the other two. I'm not sure what those other two are, but they're very close.
Um, the MAD statistic is computed below. You can see just like proportions, it's a difference. You find the difference in the means, take the absolute values, and in this case add them up and divide by three, but you're finding the average distance our three means are from each other. The average distance. And again, a MAD statistic of zero means the means are all the same. And the bigger the MAD, the further apart our means are. And here's a null distribution in this case, and again, you see a couple red dots way out in the tail. Um, our, our MAD statistic was that 1.16, and that's way, way out there, so a tiny p-value. Uh, so we do have significant evidence of a difference. Uh, when we get to theory-based here, we'll talk about you know doing the pairwise confidence intervals, but it's pretty easy to see that, if I may go back to this, you know, so we've got significant difference, so that picture before is significantly different than the other two, and I'm going to guess those other two are not significantly different, but we saved that for when we did, um, did theory-based. Um, so since we have a small p-value, conclude one, at least one is significantly different. As I said, we can do those pairwise confidence intervals to find which one it is. Um, if the confidence interval does not contain zero, and remember, then there's a significant difference between the two groups. So if the confidence interval is completely negative or completely positive, that's a significant difference. If zero is in the interval, that means the difference between those two means could be zero. And that means if the differences could be zero, that means they could be the same. And then theory base. So we're means again. So again, we're using that same validity condition we always use for means. The sample size is at least 20 in each group. Um, the MAD statistic, again, is not used for theory base, but an F statistic works well here. And so just like the MAD, the F is comparing how far apart the means are from each other, but it also takes in account the variability in the data. But the larger the F statistic, just like the larger the MAD, uh, the stronger the evidence against the null and the smaller p-value. And this test was called an analysis of variance, or ANOVA. And then we looked at correlation regression and testing that. So here I've got, this was looking at the heart rate body temperature example. The null was there's no association between heart rate and body temperature. In other words, the population correlation at rho is zero or the uh, slope of the regression line beta is zero. And the alternative is that there's some positive linear association between those two. So either rho or beta is greater than zero. And here's the data. We did a couple of these. Here's a, a small set data. We also looked at a small set and a large set, but here's the smaller of the sets of data. And you can see there's a positive relationship in the data. The correlation is 0.378. It's positive. And if there's no association, kind of just like we did in comparing means and proportions, uh, we can break apart the temperatures and their corresponding heart rates. We can break apart some association that might be there by scrambling or randomizing one of the variables. You know, it's really the same thing we did in the previous test. But in, but in this one, you remember, we can't put it into two piles or three piles, but the piles are just, it's really like the sample size. It's they have to go with uh, some explanatory variable. So after each scramble, we're going to compute the appropriate statistic, whether it's correlation or regression. That's going to be a point in the null distribution and do that a whole bunch of times and develop the null distribution. So here it is here it is with cards. So again the explanatory variable are though is the body temperature and the response is the heart rates. So the heart rates are going to get shuffled and the correlation of the actual data there you can see is 0.378. So let's shuffle them up once kind of redistribute there and here I get a correlation of 0 0.073 so much smaller than the actual data or the, act, the actual correlation. And so that's going to be a point in the null distribution. Do that a whole bunch of times, and you can see this null distribution should be centered at zero. We should get things that are about zero, sometimes a little above zero like this, sometimes a little below, and the question is, we're going to get much that is extreme as our actual data was. And here's a graph of a null distribution. Looks like I did it 10,000 times here and 530 times, we did have a correlation that was 0.378 or greater. So here we got a p-value very close to 0.05, just above 0.05. So it's not quite strong enough evidence. 
And if you remember, we also did this on a larger data set. Uh, this was just a subset of a larger data set. And we had a similar correlation. In fact, it was a little bit smaller, but a much smaller p-value. So that increasing the uh, sample size really affects the strength of evidence, it makes it much stronger. And then theory-based tests for this. Um, so the theory-based tests for correlations a little different. We don't just talk about sample size. Um, we need to have, uh, I should say, it's, it's a theory-based test really for the slope the regression line that we did. Um, the scatter plot should follow a, a linear trend to this. Um, so you shouldn't see things that go up and then come back down, but it has to be some linear trend. It's always heading upwards or heading downwards generally and should have approximately the same number of points above and below the regression line. There should be some symmetry about the line, you know, so the same number and like the same density of those. And the variability of the vertical slices should be similar as well. So you shouldn't see um, things fanning out or narrowing in. Um, when you run this test, you can either use correlation or the slope of the regression line as your statistic. And just like means, it's a t-distribution that's used. It's centered at zero. So very similar to a, a single mean test. All right, then we looked at a number of things that affect the p-value. So in all of our tests, as sample size increases, as long as nothing else stays the same, the p-value is going to decrease. Uh, when we're dealing with a quantitative response, standard deviations or the spread of the data um, affects the p-value. So if everything stayed the same but my data was more spread out, then that, that's not as precise data. My p-value is going to increase. I always think it gets worse. You know, we're always looking for a small p-value. And then the differences in things, so the differences in means or the difference in proportions, you know, as those move farther apart, that should be stronger evidence and the p-value will decrease or the slope or the correlation gets farther from zero the p-value will decrease and then remember the MAD and the chi-square and the f statistic they all have these similar properties you know if it if there's zero that means all the means or all the proportions are the same and as that MAD statistic chi-square f increases gets further out there to the right in the distribution the p-value is going to decrease all right, so here's a review of confidence intervals. Um, remember, tests of significance answer the yes-no questions, like is there strong evidence that buzz is not just guessing? Is there strong evidence that swimming with dolphins helps reduce depression symptoms? But sometimes we might want to estimate a population parameter. For example, what proportion of the voters are likely to vote in the next election? And a confidence interval is, does just that. There is an interval estimates for the population parameter. Remember, a population parameter is some fixed measurement for a population, such as proportion or a probability, a difference in two proportions, a mean, a difference in means, or the slope of a regression equation. Uh, these intervals give plausible or believable, credible values for, for the parameter. When one way to find confidence intervals, one nice easy way is with a 2SD confidence intervals. And this is when we're doing simulation and finding a simulated base null distribution and using the standard deviation from that. <clears throat> Remember, the observed statistics are going to be the center of the interval. You know, with the observed statistic like a sample mean, a sample proportion, or a difference in proportions. And then we use two standard deviations from the appropriate null distribution to find our margin of error. So the formula always is just the observed statistic that differs depending on the context, and it's plus or minus two standard deviations of the appropriate confidence interval. So here's an example that we looked at. Um, it said a Gallup poll was found that 69% of a random sample of 1,034 adults responded that the Affordable Care Act had no effect on them. And the question is, what's our estimate for the population on this? You know, so 69% of our sample, that's our best guess as to what the population parameter might be. But it's certainly not going to be necessarily be exactly 69%. We need to build a, a interval around that. And that's where this 2SD confidence interval comes in. 
So we're doing take 0.69 plus or minus 2 of the standard deviations of the null distribution. You can see my null distribution down there. And so this gives an interval estimate of 0.69 plus or minus 0.032, or in terms of percents, 65.8% uh, to 72.2%. And also remember, in these samples of about a thousand, and we looked at a few of those in class, um, our margin of error, that 0 0.032, typically is just about that. It's about plus or minus 3%, and that's typical of most polls. Now, what does the confidence interval mean? And that picture on the right there with those green and red lines, that's kind of what I wanted you to remember as to what a confidence interval means. Basically, it means if we repeated this process over and over and over again, 95% of the time, we get it right on average. So here's the situation where we're trying to estimate a population proportion. And so that black vertical line in there represents a true population proportion. You know, we don't know what it is. We take samples. In reality, we don't know what it is, but we're taking samples and estimating it with a sample proportion, and that's all those black dots that you see in there. And then with each one of those, we're building an interval around that, kind of plus or minus two standard deviations on there. So you see, when, the, when those horizontal lines are green, that means that the population parameter whatever numbers for that black vertical line has been captured in in the confidence interval and when the confidence interval is red it means it missed it you know so we'll see a few times it looks like four times the sample proportion was a little bit too high and one time it was a little bit too low when we built the interval it missed it but 95 percent of the time we're going to get it right and five percent of the time we're going to get it wrong remember the interval is the random thing here when we use the term probability, well, we use that in terms of a random event. The parameter is not. The parameter is a fixed number. We don't know what it is, but the interval jumps around if we took more and more samples of them. And then theory-based confidence intervals. Uh, using theory-based techniques, confidence intervals are easily found. We did the applet by just clicking a button. And remember, the validity conditions we had for tests of significance, those also should hold true for uh, theory-based confidence intervals. We did look at ways or things that affect the width of a confidence interval, just like we looked at things that affect the strength of evidence or the p-value. And we saw very early on that as the level of confidence increases, as we go from like 90 to 95 to 99 percent confidence, the width of the confidence interval also increases. The analogy I used was you're trying to catch a fish the more with a net. You know, if, you're, if your net is wide, if your interval is wide, you should be more confident you're going to catch the fish or catch the population parameter. And then as sample size increases, that width of the interval should decrease. The more and more evidence we get, that's the larger sample size, we should be able to be more precise in our interval, so the width should decrease. And then with quanti a quantitative response, as standard deviations increase, so as the variability in the data increases, uh, that variability, that increase in variability, should be reflected in the confidence interval. You should see more variability or a wider confidence interval. So as standard deviations increase, the widths of a confidence interval increase. That would go for a single mean, comparing two means. And then the changes in the difference in means or difference in proportions, you know, how far apart they are, that's not going to affect the width. That's only going to affect the center of the confidence interval. Um, so the center will change, but the width will stay about the same. And then connecting confidence intervals with tests of significance. This is basically what we did when we first introduced confidence intervals. And the whole idea is a small p-value means that that value of the null will not be in the confidence interval. So we're testing the null. For example, my first example there is pi equals 0.5. If we get a small p-value, then we'd reject the null. And the alternative would say that pi is not 0.5, so I should not expect to see 0.5 in that confidence interval. So under that example, I get a p-value less than 0.05, and 0.05 is what I use to compare with a 95% confidence interval. And you see my confidence interval does not contain uh, 0.5. It's all completely above 0.5. But if we get a large p-value, that means we can't reject the null. It means that value under the null is plausible. So in my second 
uh, example there, uh, the null is a difference in two proportions, and when we're doing a difference in two proportions, we can write that as one proportion minus the other, uh, the population proportions, equals zero. So I'm looking to see if zero is in the confidence interval. So here I got a p-value of 0.142, and that is big, bigger than 5%, so I should see zero in the confidence interval, which we do right there. So here's a little quiz for you. So think about these. Suppose I'm testing pi equals 0.5, so a single proportion, and the corresponding two-sided p-values, because two-sided p-values go with confidence intervals. Suppose that was 0.05, and the question is, will 0.5 be contained in a 90%, 95%, or 99% confidence interval? And really, it's the same question we're asking, but we're adjusting things along the way. Um, we're asking, is that p-value 0.03 small? or not. So if in a 90% confidence interval, that's 10% significance, 0.03 is small. It's less than 10%. It's less than 0.1. So uh, 0.03 is small, so 0.5 should not be contained in a 90% confidence interval. And for 95%, I'm comparing that 0.03 with 5%, a 5% significance level. So again, 0.03 is less than 5%, less than 0.05. So again, it's small. So no, 0.5 should not be contained in a 95% confidence interval. But realize, as I'm increasing my confidence level from 90, 95, 99, it's getting wider and wider. And where 0.5 might not be in a 90%, it might be in a wider interval, like 95 or 99. And for 99%, for example, now it's a 1% significance level, so I'm looking back at my p-value of 0.03. Is that small? Well, no, it's not small compared to 0.01 to 1%. So yes, 0.5 will be contained in that confidence interval. So if the p-value is large, greater than alpha, alpha is the significance level, that value in the null will can be contained in a 1 minus alpha percent confidence interval. All right, so here's a review of kind of the big ideas that we've, we've missed by just focusing on uh, tests of significance and confidence intervals. Some terminology. So population, sample, statistic, parameter. So a population and a sample kind of go together. So a population is the entire set of observational units we want to know something about. And a sample is a subgroup of that. And, that's, and it's hopefully it's a random sample, and then we can infer back to the population. And then a statistic is a number we calculate from the observed data, like a sample mean or a sample proportion. And then a parameter is that same type of number as a statistic, like a mean or a proportion, but it re represents the entire population or the underlying process. So statistic goes with sample, S and S, and parameter goes with population. Statistic is a number that describes a sample. Parameter is a number that describes a population. And then standard deviation, which is the most common measure of variability. Uh, we can think of standard deviation as approximately the average distance values are from their mean. So if a standard deviation was zero, that means all the numbers are the same, like 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. And then the more spread out a data set is, the larger the standard deviation. Standard deviation can't be negative. It's always some positive number or zero. Another term is skewed to the right or skewed to the left. So the distribution I have here is skewed to the right. Most of the data is piled up on the left and it's pulled out to the right. So this data set skewed to the right. Um, and in this case, the mean is going to get pulled into the direction, well, in all cases, the mean gets pulled in the direction of the skewedness. In this case, the mean gets pulled to the right. So the mean should be larger than the median. Median is a resistant measure of center where the mean is not resistant, gets pulled in that direction for skewedness and outliers. And hypotheses, null hypothesis, and alternative hypothesis, there's the, the symbols there, H sub 0 or H naught and H sub A. Remember, the null is going to have an equals in, in it. Um, typically, we can write it that way somehow. Um, with the alternative, a lot of times we write it with less than, or greater than, or not equal to. And a null distribution that we've we have obtained ever since chapter one is a distribution of simulated statistics that represents that chance outcome, that no association or something that represents the null.
And then statistically significant, another term we had, I think maybe even before chapter one, we say results are statistically significant if they are unlikely to arise by random chance. You know, it's very unlikely. We get a small p-value. And the p-value is the proportion of the simulated statistics in a null distribution that are at least as extreme as the value of the observed statistic. You know, so at least as extreme sometimes is more than, sometimes it's less than, depending on the alternative hypothesis, and sometimes we look in both directions. And always the smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence there is against the null. And guidelines for the strength of evidence, you can see I've got these in black and red, kind of indicating you think of it two ways. Like if it's less than 0.05, that tends to be strong evidence against the null. More than 0.05, it's not strong. But if it's close to 0.05, but still above, that's that's moderate. And you know, if you have a small sample size, that might be pretty good, and that's kind of good evidence. So you probably should take a larger sample size and see if you can get stronger evidence. And of course, the smaller it is, the stronger the evidence. So less than 0.01, you know, that's very strong evidence against the null. And then the 3S strategy that we've used over and over again. The first S is the statistic. Compute the statistic from the observed data. We started with a single proportion. We did a single mean, difference in proportions, difference in means. And then we do a simulation. So I identify a model that represents that chance explanation or that no association that we saw when we were comparing two variables. And just repeat repeatedly simulate values of that statistic that would happen under that chance model or that no association model to form a null distribution. And then the strength of evidence brings those first two things together. It says, well, where is our statistic in that simulated null distribution? And if it's way out in the tail, that's strong evidence against the null. If it's not, then it's not strong evidence. You know, we measured that with a p-value. And then standardized statistic, you know, Simply put, that's the number of standard deviations. The observed statistic is above or below, if it's negative, the mean of the null distribution or the hypothesized or theoretical mean of the null distribution. So the formula there is for a standardized statistic. It's whatever our statistic we are looking at, you know, a single proportion, a difference in proportions, a difference in means, a correlation, a slope of a regression line, minus the theoretical mean of the null distribution. A lot of times that was zero. Um, but back in the first chapter on a single proportion, it wasn't. It's whatever is, you know, 0.5 was a common one. It could be one third, depending on what we're testing. And then divide that by the standard deviation of the null distribution. But it's always of the null distribution, not any other standard deviation. And then two side tests. Remember, two side tests increase the p value. It's about double if you're doing simulation based methods, and it exactly doubles for theory based methods. Two side tests are said to be more conservative because you really need to be more sure of yourself to kind of say you've got strong evidence. You know, more evidence is needed to conclude the alternative hypothesis because you've doubled the p-value. In chapter four, we looked at biased and random sampling or simple random sampling. I guess it wasn't chapter four. I think it was chapter two. Um, a sampling method is biased if statistics from the sample consistently over or underestimate the population parameter. The nice example we looked at then was that uh, length of words in the Gettysburg Address when students would, you know, what they think is sort of randomly choose or what they think is a choose a representative sample of 10 words, they consistently overestimate the length of the words. And that, so that's a biased method of doing it. But in a simple random sample with a computer randomly pick numbers to correspond to words and that was unbiased. When we looked at that distribution um, that was centered about where it should be is centered on the population mean. So that's unbiased. And that SRS or simple random sampling is a way of selecting members of the population. So every sample of a certain size has that same chance of being chosen. Types of variables, you know, this is very important when we're deciding what kind of tests we do, whether we're comparing means or comparing proportions. So we split up, first of all, variables into explanatory and response. Explanatory, or the independent variable, is a variable we think is explaining the change in the response. This is the variable in an experiment where the researchers are randomly deciding which 
you know, which one to go on, on certain individuals. And the response or the dependent variable is a variable we think that's being impacted by the change in impacted or changed by the explanatory variable. And I always think of these things as order. A lot of times the explanatory variable is the thing that comes first that happens and then we change and see well, what happens to the response on that. Random assignment and causation. So this was chapter four. Uh, confounding variables that we saw are controlled in experiments due to random assignment of subjects to treatment groups. And the reason it's controlled is it tends to balance out all the variables between the groups, you know, except the one thing that we would be manipulating um, or assigning. So when you've got when you do random assignment, um, cause and effect conclusions are possible, and it's basically because we're sort of ruling out all the confounding variables because our two groups say we're just test comparing two groups. They should be about the same for except the one thing we impose. Like one group gets an aspirin every other day, one group gets a placebo. And here random versus random versus random. So we had random sampling, we had random assignment. So in observational studies, random sampling is often done and random sampling is random sampling, getting our sample randomly from the population. And that makes a nice representative sample of the population, and so we can easily generalize back to the population. Um, but experiments, that's where random assignment is done. So a lot of times in experiment, there's no random sampling. We get some volunteers to be in a study, and then they're randomly assigned to, say, two groups or three groups on there. And then different treatments are imposed. And this allows us to conclude causation. So random sampling, we can generalize back to a population, and random assignment allows us to determine cause and effect. But then the other random we've been doing ever since chapter one is simulating a null distribution. And in this, we're shuffling cards or flipping coins to see what statistic uh, would be true under a true null or null. You know, so there's another form of random. You know, we, all, we can call these things randomization tests in there. So in these randomizations where a lot of times, particularly in the previous, the later chapters where we're breaking some association between the explanatory and response variable and saying, well, let's, let's look at a distribution where there's no association. So there's really three kinds of random we've been dealing with throughout. Um, in chapter 8 and 9, when we were doing a chi-square test or a NOVA test, comparing multiple proportions or multiple means, we did one overall test first. And then if we found significance, got a small p-value, then we would do these uh, pairwise confidence intervals to find out what is significantly different from what else. And we do these overall tests, remember, because we want to hold the probability of a type 1 error down. So it, probably of type 1 error rejecting a true null hypothesis, you know, a false positive or a false alarm. That's If we're testing at the 5% significance level, the probability of making a type 1 error is 0.05. And if we did test after test after test at the 0.05 level, 0.05 level. If the null were true on every single one of them, eventually we'd get a false positive or this false alarm. So we just do this one overall test first, and then if significance is found on the overall test, then we follow up that with individual tests, or what we did was pairwise confidence intervals. Correlation, moving on into chapter 10. Uh, correlation measures the strength and direction of a linear association between two quantitative variables. So a lot of times the word correlation gets used outside of how I think of it as a really a correlation coefficient, a number, um, to really mean association. But when I say correlation, you know, it's going to be a number between a negative one and a positive one. Could be a negative one or a positive one, could equal those. And that's when the points perfectly fit on a line. With positive correlations, one variable increases, so does the other. With a negative correlation, as one variable uh, decreases, the other increases. They're just opposites. So as one variable increases, the other decreases, or one decreases, the other increases. And then the closer it is to either a negative one or a positive one, the closer the points fit to a line. And remember, a positive one, the slopes are going uphill from left to right, and negative one, they're going downhill from left to right. And then least squares regression, that was how what we used to fit a line to some data. And we call it the best fitting line, but remember what it does, it minimizes the square of the residuals. 
on there. And it's the most common way of getting a mathematical model to describe an association between two variables. The slope is that predicted change in the response for a one unit change in the explanatory variable. When you describe that, make sure you talk about both of those things increasing. So an increase of one unit in the explanatory variable goes with an increase of whatever the slope is, that number in the response. And then for a specific value of x, the corresponding y minus y hat, or actual value minus a predicted value, it's called a residual. I also called it an error. It's that vertical distance between a point and the regression line. So if the point is above the regression line, then the residual is positive. If the point's below, then the residual is negative. And that's all I've got.